I think we'll get going here, and anyone who comes late, they come late. Um, there's a sign-in sheet going around, as per usual. If you're a member, you don't have to write all the stuff down. Just, just write Y after your name, and you know that's fine. Um, the series, um, the series costs us about eight hundred dollars a year to put on. Um, we're a small, um, uh, very efficient organization. Uh, what helps us with this is Patagonia down in Freeport. They co-sponsor this, and they donate a product, to, you know, for every month, October through May. And uh, what we say is, if you'd like to help out, um, just write your name on a slip of paper, put it in the box. Here's a little thingy with paper. Throw some money in the box, and we'll have a, a um, drawing for a door prize at the end. And the odds are pretty good tonight. <laughs> so. So um, most of you are members, but not I don't think all of you are. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Friends of Mary Meany Bay is a pretty unique organization. We, um, we are a land trust. We've protected over 1,500 acres of land around the bay, generally focused on valuable wildlife habitat, which is often is wetland. And uh, if you were to look at this, um, got a large map of the bay over here on the table, and doubling as a tablecloth, if you look at that, you'd see that there's you know like 10,000 acres of uh, wetland around the bay. Um, so we do that, work in partnership with other groups as well in that effort. Uh, we do a lot of research, uh, cutting edge research over the years. We've done a really interesting circulation study of the bay using uh, um, homemade drifters with GPS units in them and stuff. And that's all up on our website, which is friendsofmarymeanybay.org. And you can watch the animated things move around and see what's happening. It's a very complicated system out here. It takes a long time to get out of the bay. Uh, and that's sort of a, one of the bigger take home pieces of that study. Um, like 10 days to get down like the Eastern River, at least 10 days from the head of the Eastern to the bay. And then once you're in the bay, who knows what's gonna happen. You could be going back up to Kennebec. You could be all around the place. Uh, could take you another week to get through the chops if you do. And even from the even if you get through the chops, you could get down to Bath and be back in the bay the next day. So it's pre, that has interesting repercussions in terms of development and uh, uh, turbidity of the water, for example. Your water is getting chewed up by, uh, or uh, clouded up by carp, for example, or a combination of carp and wind. Um, it's really hard to get rid of that sort of uh, impact. So. Uh, that sort of thing. We do a lot of advocacy. We are actually involved in uh, a couple of major efforts now. One to reopen the St. Croix River down east on the border with Maine to alewives. The state closed that down a number of years ago. And uh, uh, we're right now dealing with the EPA on that. It's been a multi-chapter effort um, and a really good one. Um, so we hope to see some victory there. And we also have the first time ever in the country, first ever um, endangered species take suits. Take is a euphemism for killing or delaying or harming in some way species. Uh, take suit uh, for dam owners uh, that are taking Atlantic salmon. As you know, there are very few Atlantic salmon left. And uh, most take suits in the past, all take suits, have typically been against agencies. And ours is against the corporations that own these dams. So there's. Uh, seven dams involved, four on the Kennebec and three on the lower end of Scoggin. And that's um, also in progress. And uh, we've got summary motions for summary judgment in front of a federal court now and so on and so forth. So, And then we have an active education program. And <clears throat> one of the highlights is that we have about a couple of dozen mounts, probably wildlife mounts. And we take these in and do critter visits in schools. And you take a critter like that in or an otter and it's like taking a big vacuum cleaner in and sucking kids out of their classroom because they just love it, you know? And so that's, that's something we do actively as well as have two really good outdoor days where kids are really getting dirty and gross in the mud and doing beach sanding and doing real archeology span digs and uh, doing watershed modeling. Kent's been doing that for us for years as a volunteer. And they just, I mean, they love it, you know? And they learn a lot. And uh, so anyway, uh, and then we have membership activities like this in the winter, part of our education program, and some outings in the summer. So if you're not a member, you might think about uh, joining us. So our speaker tonight, um, Danielle Dioria, is a bird biologist with um, Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And uh, she's got a, a bachelor's in biology from SUNY in Genesco, in New York. 
and then a master's um, um, from New Mexico State in wildlife science. She's worked about four years or so with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the 80s, you said, right? Not, well, 2000 to 2004. Okay, early 2000s, sorry. Um, and so have you been here since then, actually? Yep. Okay. So working in the bird group with IFNW uh, since then and, and focusing on uh, you know, habitat restoration, the birds, um, uh, statewide populations of colonial wading birds, uh, black terns, some black terns up on... Um, Oh, Big Lake, Belgrade, Bel yeah, Belgrade, yeah, Masolonsky. Um And then, you know, there's a volunteer heron network, heron monitoring network in the state that she uh, coordinates, and, uh, of course, the cranes. And I actually learned something really cool in writing up the press release for today's talk, and that was when I got the picture off the web, which some of you may have seen. Sandhill crane has a nice red top on it, sort of magenta crest. And I learned that when the first settlers, first English settlers came here, pilgrims, and they found, there are a lot more sandhill cranes around then, and they found these great, wonderful um, red berries that they could eat, um, cranberries. Now we know them as, they named them crane berries mm -hmm. after the top of the head of the sandhill crane. And it used to be two words, crane berries. And then it's morphed over the years to cranberries. So. I got all excited, and everyone I've told that to was like, oh, wow, so, so cool. You know, a good one to remember. If, if there are enough sandhill cranes that we can deal with our kids, you know, that'd be, that'd be good. good one. So, um, thank you all, and welcome, Danielle. All right, hopefully this won't work. Can you hear me? Is that microphone supposed to. No, it's not like a. Oh, it goes into there. Okay, good. <laughs> I didn't think I needed one. Do you want to get the lights at all? Might be easier um, I, to. I probably don't. Just try it. See, it's of, pretty I, good. I don't want to have you okay. in the dark for filming. That's the oh, okay. Okay. So, like Ed said, um, I'm a wildlife biologist with Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. I work in our bird group, which is part of our res research and assessment section in Bangor. Um, and so I deal with statewide populations, mostly of non game wetland birds, so including great blue herons and sandhill cranes. Um, and tonight I'm going to talk about these two species and kind of compare and contrast them and go into a little bit of their natural history, um, their status here in Maine, and some of our monitoring efforts that are going on. So are you guys okay? Because I feel like I'm right in front of you. Okay. So really, um, a lot of people confuse cranes and herons. I mean, they're large birds, they're overall gray in appearance. Um, and even some of the historical, early historical writings where they recorded some of the fauna that were seen here, you know, back in the 1700s, 1800s, there was mention of cranes and herons, but somewhat interchangeably, so it's hard to know exactly what they were talking about. And whether cranes really were here in abundance, um, it's, it's in some ways a mystery. But they're actually very different species. They're not even very closely related. They're in different families and in different orders. Um, so the species for the sandhill crane is Grus canadensis, and Tabida is the subspecies, but they're in the family Gruidae, which is in the order Gruiformes, which includes other birds such as rails. Whereas the great blue heron is Ardea herodius, that's the species name. Family is Ardeidae, which is most of the herons and bitterns. And then the order is Siconiformes, which also includes storks and ibises. So two completely separate orders, um, and we'll talk about some of their similarities and differences tonight. So if I'm just talking about Maine's cranes, in quotes, cranes and herons, um, we have quite a few different heron species in the state. So we have black crown night herons, American bitterns, little blue herons occur here, tricolored herons every now and then, least bitterns, great egrets, cattle egrets every now and then, snowy egrets, green herons, and of course, the great blue heron, which I'll talk about tonight. And then as far as true cranes, all we have are the sandhill cranes. So what's different about these two large birds? They stand about the same height. They have about the same wingspan, so three foot tall or so, six foot wingspan. As I said, overall gray um, color to their body. But the sandhill cranes are heavier. They're almost twice as heavy. And, you know, they, their ranges of weight do not even overlap the great blue heron. Um, 
And you can kind of see that in their build. They do look like a stockier bird compared to the great blue heron. Um, Sandhill cranes don't perch, whereas great blue herons do. They have different foot adaptations. Great blue herons, as you know, will perch in trees, nest in trees, whereas sandhill cranes do not. Um, of course, their heads look different. There's the red bear patch, and that's kind of that's a bear patch of skin on their crown that has a little bit of bristly hairs, but it's mostly bare. And they have that white cheek. And then the great blue heron has um, at least the uh, the mature adults have the white crown with the black stripes and black plumes that come off of it. And their eyes are different colored. And their bill, even though they're long and pointed, really when you look at the sandhill cranes, it's a lot stouter of a bill. It's not as pointy, it's obviously darker. And this gets into where, how they feed and what they feed on, which we'll talk about. Another difference is um, their body shape and their feathers. So sandhill cranes have what they call like a bustle, you know, like from one of the old time dresses that women wore in their rear. Um, so the rear feathers just form that bustle. And then the great blue herons have what we call in the bird world, nuptial plumes. So they're used, they're a secondary sex characteristic that are used in, um, for during mating, you know, to attract a mate. You can see the plumes on the great blue herons here erected during their courtship. As far as identifying them in flight, they're pretty similar except for two things. Their wing beats are slightly different. Um, what you can tell with the sandhill cranes is they do a slow wing beat down, but then it snaps up. And if the next time you look at a great blue heron or a sandhill crane, notice that when they're in flight. The great blue herons are more of a, um, a more constant wing beat. It's not, there's not that difference in the down versus up. And then their necks. Um, the great blue herons usually will have their neck pulled in um, to an S curve. You know, when they first take off, it might be straight out, but once they're in the air, they're, it's pulled in. And then the sandhill cranes always have their necks straight out. So getting back to the neck, um, the great blue heron, this is a schematic that shows in blue, I have a pointer. Um, this is the backbone, so the skull and the backbone, and this is the trachea. And so they have this adaptation where one of their vertebrae is modified so that they have this exaggerated coil, and that serves two purposes. It protects the trachea here, where they might get struck by another heron's bill, so it kind of is forming protection for organs, important organs. And then it also allows them to strike at their prey very fast and efficiently. And I'm gonna show you a little video of a heron feeding. And um, if nobody, I think most people have seen herons feed, but they, you know, usually stalk their prey and then they quickly grab it from the water. And so they, they primarily eat animals, so they're carnivorous primarily. They will eat um, fish, obviously, invertebrates, um, amphibians, they'll even on dry land, they'll go after snakes and rodents, but primarily animal matter in their diet. Oh, let me see if I can get my little cursor off that. <laughs> there we go. Got to see it again. <laughs> oh no, come on. <laughs> there we go. So these are sandhill cranes feeding. And you can see that they feed quite differently. They are not striking at prey. They remind me of how a goose might feed in a field. Um, they eat mostly plant matter actually in their diet. They will go after snails and insects and amphibians and even nesting birds sometimes. But Animal matter doesn't make up any more than 10% of their diet at any time. So they're mostly going after grains, um, the roots and tubers of plants. And so that's, um, you can imagine that's what they're getting here. So getting into their vocalizations, um, most of us are familiar with the sandhill cream. They, they have a bugle-like call, but maybe not. So we'll play it in a second. Um, it's really distinct. Um, one thing I wanted to show you is that the reason, so their, their voice can actually travel quite uh, a long distance and part of that reasoning is because they have a trachea that 
is a, a one and a half meters long that kind of gets coiled up into their sternum. This is the sternum bone, and it's just in comparison to another bird that doesn't have that. Um, but it allows their um, voice to travel as much as two and a half miles. So we'll hear this now. Hopefully it's not too loud. So it's a really distinct call, and if you ever hear that, it'll stop you in your tracks, and you'll be like, Stan Hill Green, where is that? Um, and they can be really secretive during the breeding season, so you might only hear that and not see them. So as far as the great blue heron's vocalizations, they're more squawk-like, <laughs> exactly. Um, they're not what we would consider melodious or impressive in any way, I don't think, and I'll play a series of their calls. <laughs> really a croak, really, I thought. Croak, yes, that's another good word to describe it. Some of these are at the nesting colony, they do different sounds. Some of them sound like dog howls and things like that during mating. But so pretty different vocalizations. And vocalizations, of course, lead into, um, you know, how they communicate with others of their same species. And what's interesting about these two species is that they're actually social species, but at different times during the year or within stages within their life cycle. Um, so sandhill cranes that you see here, they will group up mostly in the fall and during migration and wintering. You'll see them in large flocks, especially where they're abundant. Um, feeding together um, and their family, they actually sustain a family group at least 10 months after the young have hatched. Um, so then the, the young will leave after 10 months and the adults will go and nest again and the young will join a non-breeder flock. Um, great blue herons on the other hand are really only social or gregarious during the breeding season when they nest in groups or colonies. Um, and then after they nest, family members may or may not stay together, but generally they migrate by themselves or maybe a small group of two or three. Um, and they, once they're out of um, their colonies, they're pretty territorial as far as where they're feeding. So pretty different. So do they come back to the same places year after year? Yeah, they do. The, the adults- do you know where they are around here? Yes, and I'll get into that okay. for sure. Um, and I'd like to know more about where they are around here. So if you have any knowledge, let me know. So now I'm gonna kind of just go through each species a little bit, just going over their, their breeding, um, mostly their nesting ecology. So the Sandhill Crane, um, in the US, there's six migratory populations that are recognized by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which you see here in these different colors. And the ones in Maine, even though we're not on the map here, this is an old map, they're from this eastern population that primarily breed across the Great Lakes and then winter down in uh, Florida, now into southern Georgia and up into Tennessee a little bit. Um, supposed to... And when you're in Florida, they're a lot more friendly than they are up here. Yes, and so during my wintering, they're more, you know, gregarious, flocking together. They don't really, they probably don't care as much about humans watching them as during the breeding season, they're pretty secretive, so. Um, so in Maine, the birds that we have here tend to arrive back from their wintering grounds in late April to early May. Um, they look for extensive uh, large marshes that have kind of a good diversity of habitat, wetland habitat types, as, as well as a diversity of different types of vegetation. And they're pretty secretive. This is pretty commonly what you might see during the breeding season is just, you heard the call, you look around and then, oh, there's a head popping up, you know? So um, it's not like those other pictures where they're just out in the open. Um, so their nests remind me of kind of like a loon nest where they just mound up vegetation from surrounding where they, where they place their nest. Um, their nests are usually on, they're on the ground, ground level. Um, they may be floating on floating mat vegetation or attached to other vegetation. Um, and they typically lay two eggs. Um, rarely do they actually pull off two young. Um, so usually one, they'll get one out of that clutch. 
one the eggs. Hatching or, or one predated right away? Um, it's more of a competition for food, I think. Um, not that they don't hatch. I think it's more that um, for the adults to be able to provide to both young and for them both to make, survive mm -hmm. to fledging is more challenging for them. So after 30 days, they do hatch. And within 24 hours after hatching, they're actually mobile. So they're moving around out of the nest. And that makes them pretty susceptible to predators, you can imagine. <clears throat> so it's probably part of why they only pull off one young. And then this is a family group, two adults, and the young one is in the back, which you can't see its head, but um, it wouldn't have the bright red patch on it, and it's a little more brown here. Um, so it takes them about, after they hatch, it takes them about 70 days to, till they get to fly, fledging stage. And then even soon after they learn how to fly, they, they, they may migrate within a few days even after that. So they're pretty strong flyers from the beginning. How long do they take to mature to the color up on their head there? Or? I'm not sure if it's two years. I don't think it's the next summer. It's probably the following summer that they get that red color, but I'm, I'd have to check on that. Um, they rarely breed before three years of age. So. so now I'll talk a little bit about the great blue heron. And many of you are familiar with great blue herons. They're pretty, as you know, pretty common, widespread throughout the U.S. and common and widespread throughout Maine. Um, our herons most likely winter in the southeast. We've had banned records back in the 1940s um, returned from Cuba. So some birds went that far, but most generally they're, they're basically going to where there's um, ice-free areas for feeding. So they will nest um, in trees, so not on the ground like sandhill cranes, and they may nest in live trees, dead trees, or dying trees, and they may nest in wetlands or in uplands. Do you recognize this photo, Ed? <laughs> This photo was taken by Ed. So these are nests. It's like spider webs or <laughs> yeah. mold All these little gray spots are nests oh in pines. And where was that taken in? That's on Cobbesee Lake. West right? side of Cobbesee Lake. Mm -hmm. oh, and one of the larger heronries in the state? Is that yes, right? it's actually grown quite a bit. It's over. Cool. Yeah. yeah, it's a pretty impressive site. Um, so they may be on lake shores like Cobbesee. Um, there's actually a great blue heron colony in this grove of pines here, but you just can't see them. And they may be on coastal islands, so quite a variety of habitats. They build stick nests, so not like the sandhill crane which uses kind of herbaceous vegetation. They actually use twigs and they don't really line their nest either. And they build these big platforms, kind of like an osprey nest, but a little smaller generally. <sighs> and high up in the trees. And they may build, you know, they may have many nesting pairs to one tree. The most I've really come across is 13 in one tree. And it was a big sprawling yellow birch on an island. It was really neat. Um, so during incubation, so they lay about, they lay three to five eggs on average. They can lay up to seven. The most nestlings I've seen in a nest has been five. Um, but during incubation, that's kind of the quiet time in the colony. The adults hunker down during incubation, and you might say, there's nothing going on here until one gets up, turns its eggs, and then goes back down. So in this picture, there's actually at least three incubating adults. And the reason, the way you can tell, there's the head and the bill. And then there's one there, it's hard to tell with the light. And here there's an orange bill. So that's the only clue that you have that they're actually active. And that's through, you know, like a scope that you're looking at these guys. So after about 28 days, the eggs will hatch, but the nestlings do not leave the nest right away, obviously. They're small, they're up high in a tree. So it takes them 60 to 80 days to fledge. Um, so they, over that two to three months, they grow and grow. So this is an adult on the right. And these so are... The two types of cranes in the and the uh, great blue fledge about the same number of days. Yeah, it's the same number of days. It's really interesting. So even though one is stuck in a nest and one is out on its own, it takes them the same amount of time to really get to flight stage and the same amount of incubation time before they hatch. What was, what was the start time? I may have missed it if you said it, for when they actually hatch or when so, they, they start on the nest. Oh, so the, in, as far as the season, like what? Yeah. 
So in general, um, by mid-May, they will have eggs. In southern Maine, we may have eggs as early as late April. So it kind of varies across the state with ice out and when the birds arrive back and stuff. Is it the same with the herons and cranes? I'm not sure about the cranes because we only have a few sites and we have not monitored them closely, so I don't really know the timing of those. We've never seen them when we're doing the eagle flights, and I wonder if they're just a little bit later or something. You mean the herons? Or no, the, no the, cr the cranes. Oh, I think that'd be hard to see. Yeah, well, maybe hard to not. See anyway, but yeah, later from the air. So um, they're around the same time, I believe, that they start as the herons. So late April to early May is when they would be starting. Um, so these are our two nestlings that are getting pretty full grown. They're pretty close. And there's the adult. And this is one thing they do is the nestlings will pull on the adult's bill and that kind of stimulates this feeding mechanism where they'll regurgitate food into the nest. Um, so then they grow even more and these, they, when they get to this stage, they're branching out on the branches. We call them branchers. Um, and they're starting to stretch their wings, getting a little braver. And it's amazing how long they will be in this stage for. I watched a colony last year really in detail and I, you know, I'd return week after week and they'd still be out on the branches. And, when are you guys gonna fly? Uh. Um, but this is a fledgling, so this one has flown the coop already. Um, and the reason you can tell that this is an immature bird is it has a gray crown, so it doesn't have that black and white striped crown. The upper mandible of the bill is dark rather than yellow. Um, it has these the cinnamon edging to the feathers, and there's no none of the body plumes, the nuptial plumes that I talked about, coming off of its neck or on its back. And you do have one right there. And there's a good example. You can see the gray crown on that one. That's a juvenile as well. <laughs> good visual aids. So, in terms of these two species, what is their population status in Maine? Sandhill cranes, as I said, are part of what we consider the eastern population of sandhill cranes. So the ones in Maine are part of the eastern population. But that population was nearly extirpated um, back in the 18th and 19th centuries and was down to 25 pairs in 1930 in Wisconsin. Since then, there was a lot of hunting regulations that went into place. There was a lot of habitat restoration and conservation that went into place. And they rebounded quite a bit. By 1996, there was over 30,000 birds, and by now, there's about 60,000 or so, um, just in that eastern population. So that population needs to go somewhere, so they're expanding now into Maine um, and in all directions. Um, in, in Maine, we've had evidence of cranes being seen, you know, flying over, being seen in marshes since 1992, and that's during the breeding season. So we've suspected breeding since 1992, but the first breeding that was confirmed with an egg in a nest was in 2000. Um, and now they breed at at least six sites. We have not tracked this very well. It hasn't been a priority species for us. So we, every time somebody reports a crane, we don't run out and try to confirm it. But based on all the reports, there's probably at least six sites and there may be up to a dozen at this point. And we're getting more and more reports of flocks of cranes. So I was just checking on the eBird site and back in November of this year, somebody saw a flock of 20 in a field and five of those were juveniles. And two of them, I think he said, were obviously staying with adults. So they were probably a family group. The others might have been sub-adults from past year's breeding. So, um, and I've heard of other flocks, you know, people seeing 18 fly over. And so we're definitely expanding the population here. And then we're going to start, based on um, all these reports, we're starting to track them better and we'll probably be investigating them more over the coming years. So as far as what to do to help conserve sandhill cranes in general, this isn't just in Maine, but um, habitat is key for them, both for nesting, the wetlands that they need, as well as foraging. So agricultural areas are actually really important on their state, you know, staging uh, grounds. Um, and that last bullet there talking about agriculture, um, corn is actually a really high valued food for sandhill cranes. Um, and soybeans, not as much, but there's been a big shift from corn to soybeans, so that's a little bit of a current concern. Um, 
they have low recruitment rates. Um, you know, they might only pull off one young. So that, if there are declines or small populations, recovery from that is that makes it difficult. Um, some populations are currently hunted. Um, and so managing those populations and the harvests and monitoring those harvest levels and how that's affecting the numbers is important. The eastern population, interestingly, was just opened up to hunting in Kentucky only last winter. Uh, I think they were looking at, you know, the potential for harvesting up to 400 birds. And I think they had like 250 hunters who bought tags and they only harvested 50. But so that was the first time that the eastern population has been open to hunting, uh, probably since it was closed back in the early 1900s. Um, and there's probably going to be more hunting that comes comes along in different states as they expand their populations, but as long as we monitor, continue to monitor the populations and understand how these harvests are affecting them, they so should be okay. Oh, it's, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't know. I've never had one. <laughs> I've never tried them, but um, it's like any hunting opportunity. I mean, there's, it's offering opportunity for hunting. I'm sure they're tasty, at least in some people's eyes. Have you ever had crane? Okay. <laughs> And not in Maine, of course. Taste, <laughs> yeah, I would think so. I mean, being, I bet they're pretty similar to goose. I don't, I don't know, but, um, and they're a big bird. I mean, you get a lot of meat off of that, I guess, if you think of it that way. What's that? Back in the day, I'm sure that's part of why their decline began, as well as a lot of the herons. You know, they were prized for their feathers for the feather trade, the millinery, the millinery. So then switching to the great blue herons in Maine, um, these guys of course are widespread, but this map was from eBird um, in 2009, but you can, well, you can see that there's obvious gaps and this could be not just where the herons aren't, but maybe where the birders aren't, because this is all based on birder observations. But at the same time, those areas might not be as good for foraging for these birds. Um, our department is tasked with evaluating all the species in the state for whether they uh, warrant um, listing as endangered or threatened under the Maine Endangered Species Act. And so our last review was in 2007 and great blue herons came up and we saw that the breeding bird survey um, showed a decline actually from 1980 to 2007 that was actually a significant trend. So that combined with some information that we knew about our coastal population, which are the ones that nest on just the islands off the coast. Um, we had two survey dates where we had pretty good, you know, coverage of the coast, 1983 and 1995. And we actually found that in looking at that data that there was almost a 50% drop in, from 83 to 95. So that just put up a big question mark in our minds because we didn't know what was going on with the population. So we decided to list them as species of special concern in 2007 so that we could start looking at it a little closer. Um, so mentioning the coastal decline, in 1983, we had 1,208 pairs in, on 20 islands. And this is just the coast, so not talking about inland. Um, and in 1995, we had 644 pairs on only 14 islands. And I'll talk about eagles a little later, but just as an interesting comparison, eagles, of course, have been on the rebound, which is a positive thing. But on the coast, you know, their, their numbers were going up at the same time that herons were going down. So in 2008, when I came into my current position with the department, um, I decided to take a look at the great blue heron population. What did we know about where they've nested in the past? And so the map on the left, all these red dots are historic sites that were once active at some time in history in Maine. I'm sure there's others that aren't on here. That's what I could find. So then in this map actually shows what we knew about the activity of those colonies. And most of those dots are gray because we hadn't surveyed them in many years and didn't know if they were still active or not. So that showed me that we needed to do some survey effort. So we embarked on a nearly statewide census <clears throat> to, to get a look at that. And one of the most efficient ways of surveying for great blue heron colonies is actually by air. So in a small Cessna plane at low altitude, um, you can see them really well and count them without causing much disturbance. Um, 
As you can imagine, the state is huge, so that helps with covering a lot of ground. So some of the survey challenges that come with aerial surveys, it, for great blue herons, habitat is not really a limiting factor in Maine. They nest in trees, and trees cover, what, 90 to 95% of the state. Um, so the thought of trying to <laughs> survey every inch of the state was, you know, daunting. Um, so what we did instead was we targeted all those dots on the map to check those for activity, and then we opportunistically surveyed flowages that we found in between, so beaver flowages. This is um, a photo from the air that one of my co-observers took. You can see, I don't know if you can, so there's a heron standing in that nest right there. And this tree's leaning, there's two nests there. There's a bunch of others. Um, so another challenge is that the colonies that are in upland pines or in trees that have foliage on them are extremely hard to find. Like I said, there's a colony here, but you don't see it until you're directly overhead. And then once you do find them, they're really hard to count, especially when they're large colonies. Our largest colony that we know of is about 120 pairs. Um, and from the air, you know, you can see what's on top of the trees, but what's beneath the foliage and on branches down below, you can only estimate. And doing ground counts is not any easier. <laughs> um, so the timing of the surveys, especially in a large state like Maine, is difficult because, um, like I said, southern Maine has a little earlier start date for herons and breeding. In late April, they may be on eggs, but in late April in down east Maine, you might come across some ice and the herons haven't even returned yet. So that's difficult because we don't, air time is expensive. We don't want to have to go back to sites if we don't need to. Um, you know, staff time, it all adds up. So as a result of that census in 2009, we came across 83 active colonies across the whole state and tallied up 1,071 pairs. Um, 62 of those colonies were within wetlands, so very similar to beaver flowages in snags like this one. Um, 11 sites were in uplands, so mostly live pines, and then nine were on coastal islands. So remember how I said we went from 20 islands in 83 to 14 islands in 95, now we're down to nine islands in 09. So that coastal trend, just um, to look at that again, so here's the herons going down, and interestingly enough, the eagles um, you know, have rebounded really impressively over that time. And I'm not gonna blame the eagles for the herons going down on the coast, um, but I will say that they've definitely influenced what's going on on the coast. Um, many of the islands that once had heron colonies that no longer do now have nesting eagles. We've had more and more reports of eagles actually going into colonies and taking adults or young um, and killing them. A volunteer of mine this, this past May witnessed an adult eagle grab an adult heron, this was before they were even had nestlings, and drown it. So they, it does happen. You wouldn't guess that an eagle would want to go after a heron. Um, but it does happen, and so you know, the question is why? Why are eagles going after herons? And I think it's more of a food resource question. What's going on with fishery resources? Is there something that's lacking here that's not supporting all these different fish eating species? So after that, do we have a statewide trend? No, because a trend is data over time, but at least the 2009 data uh, was a new baseline. And this map just shows, as a result of 2009, where all the colonies were. You, there's still big gaps. We don't know of anything down in the Cobscook Bay area, which is surprising because it's, it would be such a great place for herons. I mean, people see herons, we just don't know where they're nesting. Um, since 2009, we've found or discovered through other people's reports about 40 new colonies. And um, so some of the old colonies that we knew about in 2009 are no longer active, but some there's new ones that have come on board. So it's just a challenge trying to stay on top of it. So in order to stay on top of it, we try, we decided to um, get some volunteers involved. So. Uh, in 2009, I also started the Heron Observation Network, which is a network of volunteers who adopt colonies across the state. And to adopt a colony, you just need to agree to monitor it at least once during the breeding season. 
and you observe it from a distance that won't disturb the birds, but that you can still count how many nests are there and how many might be active or inactive. Um, and then if, you, you know, if volunteers want to, they can visit more often, you know, up to maybe once every two weeks and record how many nestlings and that helps us get measures of productivity. Um, the nice thing about a volunteer uh, network is their hours can actually be used to help leverage federal funds for other survey efforts. So um, they're used as in-kind match, so it's a really valuable resource, not just for the data that we get, but also for more resources. So this past year, we've grown over the years. Every year, we've gotten more people involved. Um, we have 152 members or people that are interested, but not all those have adopted colonies because they might be in a location that's not near a colony uh, or it's not convenient. Um, but this past year, we had 63 volunteers who adopted 97 colonies. Not all of them turned in data. That's another challenging part of a volunteer um, you know, effort is that some people just don't uh, pull their weight or whatever you want to say. But you know, th life gets in the way, so, um, and that's understandable. So we don't always get the amount of data that we think we're going to get. But collectively, biologists, so people within our department and volunteers, collected data for 102 colonies. 53 of those were active, so a little over half, um, and with 746 pairs. But that's not, you know, you can't compare that to the 2009 results because we did not make an effort for the whole state. That's just what we saw. Um, there's a lot that did not get monitored that should have. So the Heron Observation Network has a presence on the web. We've, I started a blog um, that is mostly meant to be outreach articles, uh, interesting facts and things about different species of her you know, herons and bitterns and egrets, um, management recommendations, that kind of thing. The latest article on there is just about our stickers and some of you might have seen them on the table over there. We've partnered with um, a Maine-based conservation sticker company that um, she donates proceeds to uh, bird conservation efforts, so uh, I convinced her to do a heron one specifically for our aerial survey efforts, and they're four dollars each, but three dollars will go directly to our survey, our next aerial survey, which we're hoping will be in 2015. Um, Facebook, people are on Facebook these days, it's just another avenue of outreach for us. And those are the addresses if anybody's interested. So as far as conservation of great blue herons in general, of course there's things like predators, you know, potential of bald eagles influencing what's going on. But some bigger threats are natural disasters, you know, nesting colonially has its risks because you, you have all your eggs in one basket. And so we have all these pairs concentrated in an area, if there's a hurricane, a microburst, might wipe out the habitat. Yes, they can move to a new spot, but if you know, development creeps in on places, there might not be as many high, high quality places to go. Emerging diseases in this day with the global trade and economy, I mean, things make their way across the globe pretty quickly and that includes pathogens and things that we don't normally have here. Diseases are showing up that haven't been here before. Um, oil spills that can affect their breeding, I mean, their feeding grounds quite significantly. Um, disturbance, of course, they're very, um, they can be very susceptible to disturbance during the breeding season especially. Um, so we have guidelines on how to avoid disturbing um, the birds. And then contaminants, as far as um, they are pretty high up on the food chain within a wetland system. So they are good uh, indicators of a wetland's health. And so they can bioaccumulate contaminants. Um, in the past, you know, there's been evidence of eggshell thinning and things like black crown night herons due to DDT and DDE and stuff. So, And there's always new chemicals coming on board that we don't really know the effects on organisms. And so how that, you know, we've got all the fire retardants that are of concern. So, And then limiting factors for their populations. Uh, severe winters may be something to consider, especially as uh, global climate change is happening. Uh, we see more severe storms. If they're occurring where they're wintering, that might have an impact on their population and especially impacts to food supply. What are our fisheries resources doing and 
how's that affecting their population? So to sum it up, these two birds that look pretty similar are actually very different. Um, like I said, different families, different orders. Yes, we see them both in wetlands often, but they have different feeding ecology, different breeding ecology. Um, the, their social structure is different. So um, when you do see these birds out in the wild, don't say, ah, it was a crane or a heron. <laughs> you now know there's a big difference between these two species and you can tell others about it too. It's pretty interesting. So. Before I close, I just need to mention my funding because it's mostly soft funding. My salary and the work that I do is all comes from a bunch of different sources, but um, moon license plates, if you don't have one, consider get, getting one. Um, part of the proceeds of that go directly to non-game funding research. Um, chickadee checkoff, consider participating in that uh, come April 15th. Um, the Maine Birder Band is a new program started in, I think, 09, where the bands, I have them here, um, for a donation, you get a band that's actually the same size that you'd put on a great blue heron um, that can go on your binoculars or your camera. It's registered with our department. You have a unique number on there, so you've been banded oh. by us. And if somebody found your binoculars, they could get them back to you by calling our department and seeing who belongs to them. Um, that money all goes towards bird research and you know bird conservation so it could be land acquisition or in improving some of our wildlife management areas you know putting up a kiosk or a observation platform consider gambling outdoor heritage fund tickets those actually go right back into our department very often um, we a lot of our research is funded by the outdoor heritage fund and the other two are just some other sources that we get so that's the end of my talk. I'm sure there's questions. So. You talked about the breeding cycle, and you talked about, or I remember, <laughs> uh, sandhill cranes going back relatively early. I have this feeling that the heron that hangs out in front of my house stays until the bitter end. The bitter end. <laughs> yeah. We get, uh, well, the, the smart herons leave in October probably, but we get a lot of reports of herons in the winter um, and even into February, getting close to March. Most of those are juveniles that really don't know what's going on or they've found a place that they could feed for a little while. It's sustaining them. It's probably not really high quality. and. Um, and a lot of them actually do, and if they're going to stay that long, they probably will end up starving. We've had, a, we've found, you know, we've had reports of them dead, you know, weeks after they were first seen kind of thing in February. But um, they, they do, they should, and they do get out of here in October. But the ones that you see, I, I pointed out how to tell a juvenile. Next time you see one, see if you can tell if it's a juvenile or adult. Because um, most of the pictures I've seen have been juveniles in winter. So with, so with winter such a stress, with the herons that are further south, will they migrate also? Or do a much smaller migration maybe? Or? They may or may not. Um, <clears throat> if there's a decent place to feed all winter long, then they probably won't. Um, you know, Maryland, I think they have a population year round. They, there's no reason to go anywhere down there, Chesapeake Bay. Um, some of ours might even just go as far south as, you know, southern New Jersey. If there's no ice down there, they might not need to go further south. But um, it's thought that they mostly go to the southeast, but there haven't been many banding studies to really confirm that. It's just kind of based on observations of more birds down there during the winter. So mm -hmm. We've seen um, a, a decline over the years that you mentioned the decline of blue herons, this pond that is fairly near our house, although we, we see them every year. Is there anything we can do to encourage them? Hmm. Do you have fish in your pond? You must, if they're there. Keep the fish stocked, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That'll keep them away from other people who don't want them in their fish ponds. <laughs> um, you know, there's some people don't don't like them because of that. But, well, they're um, chubs and yeah. uh, uh, fathead minnows and yeah. fish. 
Yeah, I don't know if there's really much that you can do to encourage them to come, you know, except, you know, maintaining the quality of that pond itself, you know, and um, allowing it to be somewhat wild. I don't know what the edge is like um, as far as vegetation and stuff, so. They are very sensitive to humans um, being in their proximity. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is, you know, a lot of people will go down to Florida and say, they were two feet away from me and they didn't care. And it's so interesting to hear about that and how they're so different up here. Yeah. Um, and it's, I think it's just a population level. You know, there's so many of them down there. It depends on the time of year, what, you know, if they're stirring breeding, it would be a different story, but. Mm -hmm. uh, I was interested in the red head on the uh, crane. And uh, that would suggest that maybe it was a scavenger sometime in the, in the right. past evolutionary. Yeah, you know, the family or the order that they're in actually includes vultures, I believe. And so there is some tie there evolutionarily. Um, but I don't really know why they now have this bare head, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't seen anything that really explains that. Uh, but it is, yeah, it's interesting. But it's interesting that they're in the same, mm -hmm. you know, evolutionary, yeah. they yeah. are related to the vultures. So some remnant characteristic that. And do, do scavenger birds tend to have that just for cleanliness? Or do you yeah. Think? yeah, I think that's what it's for, yep. Keep the mites down. And, yeah. And I just wanted to, I, I live on the Kennebec across from Lyons Island, which uh, you should know about, I guess. The, Lions uh, being an I F and W Island, oh, I've, yeah. I've noticed a, a great decrease in heron uh, over the last 15 years. And uh, you know, I could get down to the water 15 years ago, and I could see 25 heron. You know, uh, mm. and uh, now you you see one or two maybe. Yeah, but, uh, they're really a lot, uh, a lot reduced in numbers. Yeah, I hear that a lot from people. So it, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Uh, just on the bald eagles. Um, I'm on Bailey Island, and we have a yeah. nesting pair there that and fledged to two young. And um, we watched one of them take a seagull and drown it. Did right you? From the wow. House. And then it also, maybe a month later, was feeding on a Canadian goose. So they will take. Yeah, large birds, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and the, I've, known, uh, I, I've seen... Uh, two uh, eagles, one of which was much dominant uh, as far as uh, strength went, trying to, trying to drown each other. Oh, and, yeah. And so they must, that must be the way they... That's a, uh, that's a method yeah. that they're I actually, familiar with. Uh, they were, I heard them uh, from the house and, uh, or heard something going on and looked down, I thought there was an eagle standing on some flotsam and, uh, I, uh, and then they went around the backside of Thorn Island, it was the tide was going out, and uh, I finally grabbed the kayak and went down there, and this one eagle had the other one in the water, almost drowned, and I ran my kayak up <laughs> into them, you know, here they were, looking at them. Wow, and, you're and, brave. <laughs> and, I, uh, and I was able to separate them. And they they both swam ashore like they, they yeah they kind of go like they this do a yeah. Fly yep. yeah and they I've both seen that. swam very well uh, one uh, one got out on one ledge and one on the other and hmm. shook and and uh, dried out and the one that was on top took off and like a like a shag you went down almost hit the water and then took off again you know <laughs> and the other one took off and went boom, into the water and. Uh, hmm. Uh, and huh? well, it was also very uh, 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 soaked with water too. And he mm. came back up on the island, and I watched him stand in a pine tree and and dry off. I watched him for an hour or so, and he stayed there. And wow! When I came back later that afternoon, he was gone. But uh, he survived, you know, huh? Can't we all just get along? Yeah. <laughs> 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 neat. That's something neat to say. Well, thank you, everybody. Right. Thank, thank you. you.